Hello again, friends, and welcome to another segment of Doc G's Wine and Spirits Review. Welcome back. Nice to see you all again. I hope you're getting into the flow of spring and uh, putting this uh, cold winter weather behind us. So as you recall, last time we spoke, we were in Italy, and we are going to stay in Italy. As you can see by my friends assembled on the table here, we are going to change the color of the wine that we're going to sample from Italy. So inspired by what I shared with you last week, and in thinking of what I wanted to do for my next segment, the natural uh, progression was to stay in Italy, but to go to some great red wines. Now, in all fairness, I could probably spend two hours, four or five segments maybe, just on Italian red wine. I'm not going to do that tonight. I am going to take you through what I consider to be the most prominent and probably the most popular red wine grapes and probably ones that you have sampled. Maybe, maybe not. And I'm hoping that after today's segment, you will. So cheers. Bienvenuti. So let's start with an overview of what might Italian red grapes, what, what's the field? So when you think of Italian red grapes, I wrote down on a piece of paper, um, did some research, and this is by no means an exhaustive list. But you're talking about Barbera. You're talking about Sangiovese. You're talking about Nebbiolo, Alianico, Nero Davola, Valpolicella, which is really not their grapes that go into Valpolicella, which I'll be talking about in a minute. Dolcettos, Primitivos, which is the precursor to Zinfandel coming to the United States, and Montepulciano, Nero Davola, among others. And that's just a small sample. I honestly didn't count. There are so many regional red grapes in Italy that it would be actually impossible for me to cover and do any of them justice in just one segment here on our review. So instead, I'm going to taste some with you, try to give you some guidelines on what good red wines are from Italy. And um, the same as we did last week with the white wines, with the red wines, I want to take you through a profile of the grape, talk about the region where it's grown, talk about potential food pairings, talk about availability. And because some of these grapes really require almost a segment on their own, which I'm probably not going to wind up doing, maybe down the road, but for now, I'll post some information that for those of you that like to sit and read um, on your smartphone or on your computer and you want to check out the information that I have, it's readily available, but I'll put it together right there in our group blog. So let's begin with our first wine. The wines, well, let me, let me tell you the, the wines that I'm going to um, deal with with you. I'm going to sample with you an Alianico one of my favorites. Well, they're all my favorites. I'm going to talk about the Nebbiolo grape. I'm going to talk about Chianti. I'm going to talk about Amarone. And I'm going to talk about, at the end, Super Tuscans. I'm going to sample all of them except for the Super Tuscan, and I'll explain why when I get to that point. So let's begin with our first grape, and that is... Um, we're actually going to start with uh, Nebbiolo. And let me, um, let me try to put this together for you in a way that will um, make some sense. So first of all, Nebbiolo is probably the, one of the most tannic grapes that you will probably ever drink if you've not already had it. And when I say tannic, it is, it needs air, it's rough, but Nebbiolo, unlike most highly tannic wines, is also highly acidic. So it's very bright at the same time it's gripping your mouth with those tannins. And when you think of tannin, think of tea. Think of tea drawing, how tea draws on your, your palate when you, when you have tea without sugar and you just drink it black. So that's what we're talking about with tannin, just to review that. So Nebbiolo is grown um, well, let me just talk about its profile. First of all, and I have a Nebbiolo in this glass, and I'll talk about the one that's, that's here on the table. 
a little bit of rose, a little bit of cherry. Ooh, I've had this in the glass for about an hour trying to aerate it. That is, it's good, but when you have a wine that tannic, you want to make sure that you have some kind of food to cut through that tannin, something, you know, like a red meat, and we'll talk about the food pairings in a minute. So this particular, Nebbiolo, is the base grape for two very important Italian, well, more than two, but I'm going to focus on two today. One of them is Barolo, and I have a bottle of Barolo here. I'm not sampling that today, and I'll explain why in a minute. And I also have a Barbaresco here, and I have an old Barbaresco bottle that has a story behind it. So let's talk about the Nebbiolo grape first. Nebbiolo comes from the Piemonte in Italian, the Piedmont region, which is in the northwest corner of Italy, going up towards Switzerland and into the Alps in the northwest region above Liguria, north of Liguria in Italy, very, very north. And uh, Nebbia is the Italian word for fog. And as the growing season has it, fog is a very prominent part of the growing season because the fogs roll in during the night onto the grapes and it does help cool them down and produce the kind of grape that you have. So climate and weather are very integral in determining the kind of wine that you're going to wind up with along with the soil and obviously with the grape variety. So there are two primary wines that are uh, made from Nebbiolo. One of them is Barolo, which is considered the king of wines and the wine of kings is the old saying about Barolo. And then there is also um, the Barbaresco, which um, I'm going to talk about. Basically, because it's the same grape, they're going to taste similar. The styles are just going to be different. Barolos have to have a minimum of three years in the barrel before it can be released. And Barbarescos are two. And if you want to sample a less expensive version of um, Nebbiolo, you can get what is called the Lange Nebbiolo, L-A-N-G-H-E. You can find them in PA, you can find them at Total Wine and at other outlets on the internet if you're so interested. But the Nebbiolo that you're going to drink either way is going to be very tannic and is going to need certain food pairings and is going to need um, time for it to develop. You generally don't, for example, a Barolo, when they release Barolos, they're generally not, quote, ready to drink. You can drink them. They're just not going to be at their peak. Barolos can last... 10, 20, 30 years. And to that point, even though I'm not going to sample one, I went out in my research. I don't have many Barolo, but I do have a few. And the one that you see here is one of my prized possessions. This is very hard to find even, because again, I don't want to break my bank. You could spend hundreds of dollars on Barolos, especially the older ones. This one is a 2000. This is the oldest wine Doc G has. And uh, I opened this for friends for a dinner. Um, back in the winter, and um, it did not disappoint. It had sedimentation in it, which is what happens when wines sit a long time. I had to aerate it three or four times, and the sediment was so heavy in the aerator that I had to do it um, a couple times before I got all of the sediment out of it. But then when we drank it and had it with our meal, um, it was absolutely fantastic. I only have two of these left, so... Um, this one, I, I got through Wine Access. Um, you're not going to probably find a 2000 Barolo anywhere that you shop except at exclusive wine shops. This one, fortunately, only ran me about $45. So I only have one other one left besides this one. So I'm, I'm not sampling this one today. But it will ha <clears throat> if I were to, oh, I can tell you from having had it, very subtle cherry. It's got uh, earth on it. It was still very um, tannic, but in a good way, because we had it with a nice Italian meal. Um, we had it with brajol uh, steak. It just was mm, perfect match for that meal. So if you want to go out and try a Butterolo, they're available. 
just pull one off the shelf. I don't have a specific recommendation. The ones I've had, I've gotten all online. And I'll be honest with you, because of their expense and the need to age them, I don't drink them frequently. But when I do, they never, I've never been disappointed by a Barolo. Never. So uh, if you're interested in a Barolo, check them out. You'll be drinking the Nebbiolo grape. And um, I would recommend starting, they probably need five years minimum. So when you're looking for a Barolo, if you find one that's 20, 2017, it may be just ready. So 2017 or younger, if you can find them somewhere in the five to 10 year range, they're ready to drink. Uh, the wine purists would say they haven't hit their peak yet, but you can go ahead and do what you want, as I've always advised you to do on our spots. So let me put that Barolo aside, and let's go to the other version of Nebbiolo, which is called Barbaresco. So the Barbaresco that I have here, this is another $40 bottle. I, I'm not trying to brag, but these, these good Italian red wines are not inexpensive. You can find them a little bit less expensive, but uh, you get what you pay for, and you want to be very careful that it's not blended with something. So this Nebbiolo is a Barbaresco. It is a 2016. I've had this for a couple years, so I finally, I'm at that five, six year window now where this wine is starting to take on, it's ready, it's ready to drink. Big earth, almost like Pinot Noir, but woo, wow, this wine needs some food. And the food that I would recommend for you to have with a Nebbiolo would be some mushroom dishes. Mushroom risotto comes to mind. We had uh, Nebbiolo and the Barolo with a steak, brajol, if you've ever heard of brajola. Uh, so it's a stuffed steak and rolled with red sauce on it. Uh, anything with meat sauce, pasta. And you're going you're gonna to spend, if you want to get a Nebbiolo and you want to get into the entrance, get a Longa Nebbiolo to see if you like it. They're a little softer. They don't need as much time in air, and they would not let you down. So that's the one that I have here for you. Just do some research on Barbaresco and on, on Nebbiolo and see what you can come up with. If you're, I, I would highly recommend that you at least try the entry point wines, about $15 to $20, if you can find yourself one. So let me set that one aside, put it up here on our wine shelf. And I have a story for you. My wife and I went to Italy in 2015, and the name you see here on the bottle is probably one of the prominent Italian winemakers. His name is Gaia, G-A-J-A. -A. And when I was in Italy, I made it, this is 2015, and I made it a point, I told my wife, I'm going to find myself some Gaia. I might not be able to bring it home, so I might not have bought this 375 milliliter bottle. It is a Barbaresco. It is a 2011. 14.5 alcohol by volume. These Italian reds are big. And one night, after I found it in the wine shop in Italy, I actually bought it in, um, in Porto Fino when we were on our um, tour of Italy in 2015. I sat and drank it. She didn't really like it. I had myself a half a bottle of wine, and I stuck that bottle home in my suitcase, and now it adorns Doc G's wine cellar. So, and this, are you ready? 2015? This was 100 euros for this little bottle. At that time, that was about $110. This guy, this is big time wine. That's why I kept the glass bottle. I don't do that very often. As a matter of fact, it may be the only bottle that's empty of any value to me. So, Barbaresco, it was good. I didn't care. I had it. I just drank it. I didn't even have it with a meal. I just drank it. <laughs> it was fantastic. So, please, if you get a chance, get a hold of some Nebbiolo and see how it turns out for you. So let's move on from our, I'm going to keep that one right here. Let's move on to our next one. And our next one is going to be the, probably the most popular wine that people are aware of from Italy called, San, for the great is San Giovese, the wine is Chianti. So... Let me move this Nebbiolo aside. We don't want to confuse that with our Chianti. In this large glass here, you see the Chianti wine. So what is this grape all about? 
So if Chianti, remember, is a region, it is not a grape. The grape in here is San Giovese, which is, the folklore has it means the blood of Jove. So there's a lot of, they might, there's confusion. I don't want to say confusion. There's a little bit of debate about the exact origin of the word. But the common folklore is it's the blood of Jove, because San Gio is the root for Latin for blood. Mm. Herbs and cherry. Milder tannins in the Nebbiolo, for sure. This grape is grown all over Italy. Mm. Nice acid. Mm. Not as gripping on the tannin. Its main home, though, is in Tuscany, where you get different versions of Chianti. So when you talk about Chianti and the, and the, the production of Chianti, there's a whole... Um, a whole system of classifying Chiantis. This one is a Chianti Classico Reserva, as it tells you in the bottle. When you go to look for a Chianti, look for, and it's on this bottle, you want to look for the red symbol with a black rooster. That means it's officially from the Chianti, it's officially Chianti Classico, and it doesn't get that stamp without being from that region. It doesn't necessarily make it a great wine, but it does ensure you that it geographically has come from a particular area, from that Doc G. As no pun intended, that's what they're called in Italy. Denominazione de origen controllata y garantita. Doc G. <laughs> that's my best Italian. So, at any rate, it's a very, it's a very versatile, uh, food-friendly wine. Everybody goes Chianti and pizza. Guess what? Can't, can't, can't miss Chianti and pasta with red sauce. Can't miss Chianti with just a steak. Can't miss Chianti with a burger and bacon. Can't miss Chianti with, I have to say it, you can do this one just with a glass too because it is not a big brooding wine. This Nebbiolo over here requires some food unless you just feel like sip it. You can do what you want as I've always said. So, um, the other form of Sangiovese that you'll see coming from Italy that I'm not really going to sample here tonight is uh, Brunello di Montalcino. So, when you hear someone talk about a Brunello, you're talking about Sangiovese. So, with Sangiovese, the Brunello probably comes from a subgroup, uh, subvariant of the, the grape called... Uh, Sangiovese Grosso, which means fat, heavy. And the Sangiovese that goes into the Chianti is Sangiovese Piccolo, which is the smaller. Piccolo meaning small. So when you're getting a Chianti, you're probably getting Sangiovese Piccolo. When you get a Brunello di Montalcino, and they're pricey, but they're fantastic. I've had a few in my day. I don't happen to have one in my stock right now, um, but they are all equally uh, as wonderful as um, a good Chianti. So in terms of um, Chianti and where you can get it, there. this is when you're going to walk into the store and you can, I don't care where you go, Total Wine, you can go to um, PA Wine and Liquor, you can get it online. There's tons of good Chianti. There's also some tons of bad Chianti, so you might be careful. Again, I'm going to put you at a price point. I would recommend you stay around 12, 13, 15, and 20. You don't need to spend much more than 20 to get a really good Chianti Classico. And if you can go with a Reserva, that just means they're aged longer and they have a little bit more, um, a little bit more character, for lack of a better word. So this one that I'm drinking here is a Familia Castellani Chianti Classico Reserva. This one I was fortunate enough to get from Wines Till Sold Out. And I got this one for $13 a bottle. And um, it's a very, very typical example. I've had this one several times. It's one that I keep around. Never, never disappoints. Very smooth, very nice. Wonderful little wine. So just remember, pizza, red sauce, Chianti. Can't go wrong. So, 
I'd also like to put in a little bit of word for um, the Sangiovese being grown in the United States. If you see some Sangiovese made here in the United States, some good Sangiovese coming from um, Washington State, and if you happen to come across a Sangiovese rosé, it will be good. I don't happen to have one, or I obviously would have featured one here, but I don't have one. So we'll just have to stick with the one we have. So let's set these two guys aside. And now I want to go to the next grape, and we're going to move to the south of Italy. And this grape, if the king of the north in Italy is Nebbiolo, the king of the south is this grape called Alianico. And this is another big red wine. It has dark fruit. Not very aromatic. Um, a little bit smoky. Mm, more fruity than the, the other two. Not near as tannic. A little bit smoother. And um, it can be very tannic, medium, medium body, medium acid. These Italian red wines are all known for their good acid content, which makes them very, very food friendly. So this wine hails from Campania, which if you, we talked about last week is down toward uh, Naples. It also comes from Basilicata. It also is uh, a grape that comes from the island of Sicily. So, um, Alianico is another one of those wines that you can probably find at that $15 price point. That's a sweet point. You don't, you don't need to spend $30 on a bottle of Alianico. These Italian red wines are just good. They're sturdy. They're very food friendly. Um, this one, again, I found on um, WTSO. And this one is uh, $15. So if you Google Alianico or you go to the PA Wine and Spirits website, Total Wine website, you'll find an Alianico. I'd ask you to try one. I don't know a lot of people who, outside of my, my close friends who I share a lot of wine with, who've sampled Alianico. And that's your loss. This is fantastic. And none of these are, they're all red. You know, oh, red wine, blah, blah, they're all the same. No. The, uh, you remember our adage? Macintosh apple does not take like, taste like a Granny Smith. Red grapes don't taste like white grapes. They're different. And I suggest, now, I urge you, I'm urging you to try one of these, any one of these, that before we leave here tonight will be worth your time. So, here's to Alianico. trying to take small sips. These are all big wines. <laughs> I have to make it to the end of this. This one, however, is only 13.5 alcohol by volume, but um, it is a fantastic, and it also got a 2019 decanter, which is a European magazine, British magazine that rates wines, 92 points. So this is good wine, $15. Go find yourself one similar. So let's move Alianico off to the side here. We're getting close to the end here. My next one is one of my favorites. And this is called Amarone del Val Policella. Now, let me talk to you a little bit about Amarone wines. Because first of all, they are not cheap. And the reason they aren't, when you hear how they're made, is why. First of all, there's not a high yield. Nobody in the United States is making Amarone. You're not going to find one. This is a purely an Italian wine. You'll get Nebbiolo grown here in the United States. Alianico, there are even some people growing Alianico in California, believe it or not. I haven't had it yet. I'm going to I'll get around to that. You get Sangiovese all over the West Coast in this country. You're not going to get Amarone. Amarone is a red blend. It is a blend of Corvina, Rondinella, Molinara, and a few other smaller grapes may go into the mix of an Amarone del Valpolicello. Now, um, 
It hails from the Veneto region. For those of you familiar with Italian geography, Veneto is off to the west, excuse me, off to the east in Italy. It's the Adriatic is on the eastern coast of Italy and the Mediterranean is on the western coast of Italy. So the Adriatic and up toward Venice is where you'll find where these grapes are grown in the Veneto, near Verona. Um, and um, that's the home of Valpolicella. And Valpolicella wines are always blends. And these Amarones are always blends. Now, the one thing they do with an Amarone is they actually, in the way of making it, they dry the grapes. So there's a little bit of residual sugar in this wine, but it's really not sweet. It's very, very balanced. But they dry the grapes either by the old method where they just let them sit longer or they actually heat them up a little bit to, you know, <laughs> speed up the process so they can sell wine. But the Amarone is, is made from partially dried grapes, which intensifies the flavors and the aromas and to a certain degree, the alcohol that's in the wine. So when you get an Amarone, that's what you're getting. It will be very fruity. It will be um, oh, it smells like it smells like kind of like a Cabernet, but more like a Zinfandel, but more. Mm, big current, almost tastes like a port. Very little tannin. Oh my God, this is this should almost be served with like a chocolate cake. It's almost like a port but it really can stand up to blue cheese, lamb, big red meats with sauces. It needs, it will pair well with all of that. That typical Italian fare that you can think of. One of the classic pairings that you have with, um, with this is a blue, something with blue cheese. So um, I do want to say something about this wine before you decide to go out and buy it. It's expensive, and I'm not going to kid you. But guess what? Doc G found this one for 20 bucks on wines till sold out. And I got lucky. Now, I have seen a few chairman selections in PA where you can get them for 25 But more than likely, these are north of $30 and $40 a bottle and can get up into the triple figures. So if you really are interested in it, and you want to splurge some time, and Amarone is really worth your time and effort. So, um, this one is called Juliet Amarone del Valpolicella, 2016. I got it for $20. You can't find it anymore. So, if you're interested in an Amarone, you're going to have to go out and find one. Chairman Selection PA Wine and Spirits. Total Wine probably has a lower end one. And when I say lower end, lower price, doesn't mean you're going to get a bad wine just means you're not going to spend a lot of money. Mm, a little spicy on that. That's really very good. So that ends the sampling. So what I'd like to close out with you tonight is something that Italy has done. It's called Super Tuscans. And a Super Tuscan wine is really Italy's answer, and I happen to have one. Italy's answer to kind of what they do with blending grapes in Bordeaux. So what the Italians decided to do, and this is maybe 40, 50 years ago, they decided to blend some of the, the um, highly prized French varietals, Cab Sauve, Merlot, Syrah, maybe a little bit of Petit Bordeaux, and make what they call a Super Tuscan. However, the base grape in a Super Tuscan, they call them Toscanas, is Sangiovese. So Sangiovese will be the principal grape in a Super Tuscan. And I can tell you, I've had a few, not many. Every one I've ever had is a fantastic wine. The bottom line is, is if you really like Sangiovese and like Chianti, these are blended Chiantis. That's really that simple. These can get extremely pricey. But I did some research and I did find that you can get one. Just look for, just Google Super Tuscan Wines at PA Wine and Spirits. 
feed it into total wine and see what you can come up with. You won't be sorry. It's one of those wines that you maybe want to have one or two in your cell. I only have one, just this one. This one was another $40 bottle of wine that I got through Wines Till Sold Out. And it is, this one's called Concerto. It's a 2015, it's not ready. It may be, I'm gonna let it sit a little while yet. And it is a 80% Sangiovese, a 20% Cabernet Sauvignon, and it's 14.5% alcohol. So that's another big red Italian wine. So that brings us to the end of our excursion through Italy. You've seen your reds. You've seen the whites last week. I urge you, when you get to the wine store next time, spend some time in the Italy section. There is a treasure trove of fantastic wines. I would, again, urge you to stay at the price point, about $15, 15 to 25 whatever your budget can, can swing, and go get yourself some good Italian wine and keep it available for you. So, until the next time, may you enjoy the good weather that's coming. May you stay healthy, stay safe, and until the next time, ciao.